Welcome everybody to another episode of the Unreasonable Art of Living podcast. I'm your host, Gerhard Molin, and as always, enjoy the music. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed my little sing-along session. Hey, welcome back, back. <laughs> welcome back to another episode, episode number 17. And hey, thank you for joining. Yes. First and foremost, as always, I hope you're doing fine wherever you are right now. So thank you. Thank you so much for yeah, choosing to spend your time listening to this podcast. Very grateful. Um, yeah, what I, it's actually it's funny. Like for this week's episode, I was early this week thinking about uh, something completely different as this week's topic. And two events happened this week, which inspired me for this week's episode. There's very strong heart resonance, and I found it beautiful. Sometimes you just like think think about something that you want to talk about, but then like this, yeah, it just this inspiration comes from so somewhere, and you're like, yeah, I want to share this more about it soon i'm just taking the video recording i found a cool way to kind of like display text behind my head (laughs) it says hey everybody with a heart emoji you can watch it on youtube if you want (laughs) but now it's switch it all right back to normal uh yeah what a week uh has been really really great week my lumi score has been up quite high 4.33 there has been yeah you know yeah it has been really good week creativity learning has been really high this flow research flow coaching program um has started and there's already so much i've learned and applied to my own life i will share about it in a second and um yeah another highlight was uh, my friends lumi with i'll talk about it soon has is related to one of the events that happened this week and also like yeah uh co-programming co-programming session with Niklas this week as well was uh, we because he is in Helsinki we had a Lumi co-programming remote session and there has been a lot of progress for the Lumi app a lot of breakthroughs and also thanks to actually techniques are now learned from the Flow Research Collective to really get high output high quality output in a very short amount of time uh, has been remarkable but yeah what is up to next week so this is going to be my last episode <laughs> not for, <laughs> for this episode for this podcast but in vienna i'm gonna go to copenhagen on monday to visit a friend and it's gonna be also like um the reason why i go there is also to have a guest interview with her and a few episodes ago i talked about the conscious masculinity and i will interview her about uh, yeah, the yeah fem- the feminine perspective is really looking forward to this episode and this interview but also to visit copenhagen love the city i have to been once so i'm really really excited to be there then Helsinki, and then Peru uh, for three weeks with my mother. She's very excited. <laughs> I'm very excited. <laughs> it's going to be so cool to experience this with her. But yeah, let's get maybe, um, before we get into the main topic, let's talk about um, some things I learned already from the Flow Coaching Program. It has been really cool. And I... So what I learned from there, it's not about just the flow science, but also like coaching, coaching theory, coaching modalities, the psychology behind it. But this week it was like some very tangible advice about how to actually create situations to get into flow states. And for you, those who don't have never heard about flow, it's a concept that describes the state of mind where you know that you're so absor- um, you're so absorbed into a task where time and space or the perception of time seems to just like disappear and you're just like in it like time stands still you just do things you execute things you don't think about it you're just really in this highest form of performance and it's beautiful and they looked into like the flow moments and you can see it happens we all can achieve it you uh this does need to be like physical physical like it can be physical things of doing things <laughs> yes, like the things of doing things okay <laughs> let's try this again it can be high performance uh, athletes it can be 
your everyday, you know, like your task you're doing to reach this flow state is something uh, anyone can achieve. And I'm sure you have experienced it in one form or another. And today I watched a video about morning routines. Very funny. They looked into morning routines and... You know, there's so much out there, like to first take a cold shower, to maybe do yoga, to that and that, to get, get it ready for the day. But then they looked into, for example, um, very successful people. And what they've realized is that most of those people don't have this strong morning routines. It just gets straight into work. It just starts. And it's so funny, like a few weeks ago, and I was in August, more than a few weeks ago, I talked to a friend of mine, Juho. He works with Kirsty Lonka. She's a leading professor in positive psychology and she recommended him the same thing that you know like the best time to write or the best time to write a research paper is just right after you wake up you just get up and start working and he tried it and he said yeah it works really well so they said the same thing that actually and why why is that that actually your flow readiness is the highest just after you wake up by default you don't have to create anything you don't have to hack your your mind or like think about the environment and why is it that our f readiness to be in this flow state is the highest right after we get up? It's because our cognitive load is the lowest. You know, think about it. When you wake up and during the day, you there's like so much things happening, things you kind of ob observe consciously, sub subconsciously. So your cognitive load, it's like a battery. It's like charged more and more and more. And the higher it is, the lower your flow readiness is. And... After wake up, after a good amount of sleep, you are just ready to get in a flow state. So you should actually take advantage of this and not spend time on kind of like a morning routines that should get you ready because you're already ready. So it's the first learning. And I think I tried it. And um, this is one of the next few experiments I'm going to try even more. But the other experiment I really tried fully this week was to apply this notion of, instead of thinking about time as linear co correlation to have, if you spend more time, you have more output, to actually reverse the whole thing. And we have lots of science that back up this claim that actually um, the ideal time for someone to work on something with really quality output is between three to six hours a day, focused work, not more. And one trick uh, you can apply right away is to set yourself a deadline. You say, today I've I have only four hours to do those things. You have to have clear goals, of course. And after those four hours, you have to stop. You're not allowed to work anymore. And I tried that. And it's amazing. I tried it for yeah, almost every day. And I had gave myself three and a half to four hours. And wow. I mean, I was really... The amount of work I got done, but also the quality I got done was more than I've ever achieved before i got work done that would maybe require two days i got it done in three and a half hours and then i just stopped and recovered because that's what they say next the thing about um flow there are four stages four cycles it's first the struggle phase then the release phase then the flow state itself where you're in it and then the recovery phase the four cycles to it now we'll talk more about it over the upcoming weeks but what many people ignore, so to get into flow state, I think also what they saw that in many successful people, it's like, yeah, it, you can go straight to work. After you get up, it's the best time to do things. But what's even more important is the recovery phase afterwards. Because if to be in a flow state is highly taxing on your brain. You are performing at your highest level. Like there's like an almost like, think about like a lamp. It's just the brightest it's shining the on the at the on its maximum for thro three four hours there's like dopamine serotonin all these neurochemicals are just operating and being released and you're just performing at your highest peak so this is taxing for your brain so it's super important to recover afterwards so you can you don't um fall into this trap of yeah this overdrive which can lead to burnout and what's important about recovery it's recovery does not equal relaxation. So many people think about um, the best way to recover is like, yo, you, after work, you come home, you watch Netflix or 
you treat yourself with something sweet or you drink, treat yourself with a beer to calm down or a glass of wine. But this is not recovery. It's relaxing, yes, but it's not recovering. Recovering is something actually that can feel not relaxing at all. It could be an ice bath. It could be go to the sauna, heat exposure. It could be, you know, exercise, really in intense stretching. Of course, it could also feel relaxing, but what's important is recovery doesn't equal relaxation. You have to actually do things that um, reduce this whole cognitive load and reduce your, like this, where you are, this high performing state and reduce all these chemicals in your, in your brain again to reset. So that's active recovery. It's not relaxation. Super interesting. So I've tried this whole week and it has been working really well. Uh, I will keep you informed and share with more learnings I've done, uh, I've learned over the next weeks. And yeah, before we get into the main topic, so it was already fascinating itself, the flow flow science. And actually, if you want to, yeah, well, sh the next month will be a lot about flow, uh, the flow science and how to get into it and the psychology behind it. And yeah, I just the other day I, I checked Spotify and I thought, like, wow, 31 ratings already. And like, because I don't check the analytics too often, I feel like that's not the important thing about this whole podcast. For me, it's the joy of creating this content, the joy of sharing it with you, and the joy of receiving feedback and having conversations with you. That's, for me, the most important thing. And then I said, wow, 31 ratings. That's amazing. That's so awesome. So thank you so, so much for everyone who has been rating this podcast um, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you, you know, whatever platform you're listening to it. And yeah. If you haven't supported it yet and you want to support it, yeah, please give it a five-star rating because it helps the algorithms to share this podcast beyond my social reach. And if you think like, oh, this episode could be beneficial for a friend, please share it. And But most importantly, yeah, if you enjoy it, then I enjoy it. So thank you. Thank you so, so much. Okay, so main topic of today, of this week, 12 minutes in. <laughs> we are not there yet. <laughs> By the way, did I change the frame? Yes. I'm just checking the video as well so that I don't have the text behind my head anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can watch it on YouTube, The Unreasonable Art of Living. The channel is there. Um, I use it. I just uploaded it because I use it as material for the short reels, but it's not going to be my main thing. But you can still watch it. Subscribe and leave a comment. Yes. Um, this week's topic... <laughs> I'm not sure if the title is going to be final, but currently uh, the topic is about a relation culture is the last 50 days or a culture is the last 50 days or a relationship is the last 50 days. And there's two events that really inspired me this week that happened. It's A, something at work or like the current work, which I'm leaving next week. Next week is the last week. And a an conversation with a dear, dear friend of mine. Before we get into the, before we get continue, I want to, warm up uh, with a beautiful video i was just some a friend of mine she shared it with me today in the morning it was very fitting it's about four agreements and dreams and yeah i will just share it's a four minutes video it's called it's from matthew decay the four agreements and if you have watched it on youtube you will see it now a frame in frame i'm leveling up guys <laughs> and, and, and girls <laughs> men and women <laughs> <laughs> people let's say people all right let's watch it enjoy what you are seeing and hearing right now is nothing but a dream you're dreaming right now in this moment. You're dreaming with the brain awake. Dreaming is the main function of the mind, and the mind dreams 24 hours a day. It dreams when the brain is awake, and it also dreams when the brain is asleep. The difference is that when the brain is awake, there is a material frame that makes us perceive things in a linear way. When we go to sleep, we do not have the frame, and the dream has the tendency to change constantly. Humans are dreaming all the time. 
Before we were born, the humans before us created a big outside dream that we will call society's dream, or the dream of the planet. The dream of the planet is the collective dream of billions of smaller personal dreams, which together create a dream of a family, a dream of a community, a dream of a city, a dream of a country, and finally, a dream of the whole humanity. The dream of the planet includes all of society's rules, its beliefs, its laws, its religions, its different cultures and ways to be, its government, schools, social events and holidays. We are born with the capacity to learn how to dream, and the humans who live before us teach us how to dream the way society dreams. The outside dream has so many rules that when a new human is born, we hook the child's attention and introduce these rules into his or her mind. The outside dream uses mom and dad, the schools and religion to teach us how to dream. Attention is the ability we have to discriminate and to focus only on that which we want to perceive. We can perceive millions of things simultaneously. But using our attention, we can hold whatever we want to perceive in the foreground of our mind. The adults around us hooked our attention and put information into our minds through repetition. That is the way we learned everything we know. By using our attention, we learn a whole reality, a whole dream. We learned how to behave in society, what to believe and what not to believe, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, what is good and what is bad, what is beautiful and what is ugly, what is right and what is wrong. It was all there already, all that knowledge, all those rules and concepts about how to behave in the world. When you were in school, you sat in a little chair and put your attention on what the teacher was teaching you. When you went to church, you put your attention on what the priest or minister was telling you. It is the same dynamic with mom and dad, brothers and sisters. They were all trying to hook your attention. We also learn to hook the attention of other humans, and we develop a need for attention which can become very competitive. Children compete for the attention of their parents, their teachers, their friends. Look at me, look what I'm doing, hey, I'm here. The need for attention becomes very strong and continues into adulthood. The outside dream hooks our attention and teaches us what to believe, beginning with the language that we speak. Language is the code for understanding and communication between humans. Every letter, every word in each language is an agreement. Once we understand the code, our attention is hooked and the energy is transferred from one person to another. It was not your choice to speak English. You didn't choose your religion or your moral values. They were already there before you were born. We never had the opportunity to choose what to believe or what not to believe. We never chose even the smallest of these agreements. We didn't even choose our own name. As children, we didn't have the opportunity to choose our beliefs. But we agreed with the information that was passed to us from the dream of the planet via other humans. The only way to store information is by agreement. The outside dream may hook our attention, but if we don't agree, we don't store that information. As soon as we agree, we believe it. And this is called faith. To have faith is to believe unconditionally. Yeah, wow. Powerful, powerful video. Uh, lyrics. Um, yeah, I've listened to this actually today um, in, yeah, after my meditation, after I, oh, wait, I'm just checking out the sound. Okay, it's all good. Like it. <laughs> today in the morning after my meditations and um, my eyes closed and I was like, wow, this is so fitting. You can replace dream with culture. <laughs> it's just like uh, very fitting and what inspired me this week's topic? Two events, one article. Actually, let's first mean like give credit to the article by Jason Free, the CEO and co-founder of 37 Signals, one of my role model companies. They do things so differently. They are very principle-driven. They don't follow this 
Pixar Startup Unicorn VC how do you say craziness? Um they're very what are you saying? There's a word for it. Let's check it. Yeah, they're very vocal and very pronounced. They're like actually I have it on my phone. <laughs> getting real uh, because they, they publish so they published um jason freed published a few books about their principles and their their values and one i find very yeah that's the word <laughs> sorry <laughs> i just realized again <laughs> trying to say something not being prepared <laughs> they're very opinionated and um but in a very good way they really try to challenge many myths or like perceptions of how to run a company, how to run a product, you know, to challenge this hyper growth, hyper scale. And it's very refreshing because what I, when you read their books, they really think about why they do things, how they do things. They're very aware. They're very conscious. They're very mindful founders, a very mindful product, which you don't find often anymore. They're very conscious about, you know, why, what are we doing here? Similar to, I think, the same league as Patagonia, one of also one of my favorite companies. Tea break. Today I have uh, again jasmine green tea. Very delicious. I must say I'm. I'm just uh, yeah. I need I need to level up my tea game. I have only two sorts at the moment: the chai. What's that one? Chai tea and green tea. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it's not that green matcha tea as last time I. I mentioned. Anyways, back to the topic and railing up. <laughs> so he wrote something, um, an article about like a culture the last 50 days and why he said it's 50 days because it's enough time for a new behavior to emerge. And I found it very fitting. And then it, I read this article a long, long time ago. And then I two things happened this week. First, I had my exit talk with the current company, which just, you know, like norm, it's a normal way of if someone leaves a company the exit conversation is about like sharing feedback what went well what we could we improve and kind of like we then we talked about also the topic of culture and like you know it felt like that they seem that for them they have this idea what the culture is but then like or what they would like to be but what they do doesn't really match and you know like time i've been at the company that like a lot of things over and over have been mentioning but nothing really has changed and, you know, for many cultures, like this very vague term that, you know, like many think many people think about so like culture is something that happens automatically. It just happens organically. You don't have to do much. But actually, it's quite contrary. A culture is something you need to do. You need to be very proactive about it. You need to be very intentional about it. You, be, you need to be very aware and conscious about it. It's not something that just happens organically for the best, for the better. It can go derail quite, quite heavily if, you, if you're not aware of it. And the second event that happened was this week was with my dear friend, Pete. He's from Australia. He lives in Melbourne. He actually works at the same company. And we met around, wait, 2013, I think, was it? So 10 years ago. Wow, it's a 10 years anniversary. Hmm. Wow. It makes him like, uh, now that I think about it, it actually gives me, is it 10 years? Something like that. Yeah. Um, we met at Crytek 10 years ago. And it was in Frankfurt. We both worked there. He was we worked there already. We met, got to know each other, and we became really good friends. We then, yeah, maintained our friendship. Uh, it was a long distance friendship most of the time through traveling together, visiting each other together. And um, yeah, I think this year, so after ten years, like a lot of things happened. Uh, he's now engaged. He's planning to have a family, and he's just an amazing human being. And he was the first person I shared the Lumi method with a few years ago, and we used the Lumi method to catch up every month. So we sh rated the categories, and then we shared about why we sh why we rated the categories. It was a very beautiful way to catch up to have a really deep dive conversation with a friend. And also, like we had a podcast together uh, five years ago uh, called "The Futurish," and yeah, he will probably be a, one of my recurring guests to just have a. Uh, Futurish 
yeah future style episode here in the podcast can't wait anyway so as in any relationship and i think that's why it's so fitting a relationship culture a culture or relationship culture is nothing else we if you want to boil it down to the smallest unit it's just how two people interact and any culture or be it a friendship culture a relationship culture like between two uh, like partners a family culture or company culture is nothing else it's always the same how you do things and it's actually a moving average of the last let's say 50 days you can also last 60 days or last two months anyways it's a moving average and what happened like this year with my friend Pete so we had I was visiting him in February first Melbourne because we work at the same company and then we went to Byron Bay together it's a surfer town and we both had like we were both in a kind of like difficult period of our lives independently and then we spent time together we haven't met seen each other uh, for a year at least and we've, we both kind of like felt like oh something is different at least I can speak for myself is like I was not really fully I, sh I didn't give him the awareness I should have as a friend because I was kind of like observed with my issues in my life and he had his issues we, we weren't we were physically there but we were mentally apart and I think few things kind of like this all had to collide a bit so to kind of like also like are acknowledging that we're not the same people that we were used to 10 years ago we we're quite different I mean I was like 23 years old he was 30 years old if I'm not mistaken we're completely different people and sometimes in relationships and again when I talk about relationships I also refer to company relationships because it's nothing else if you're not aware of where you are and you're not really actively working on it you kind of like get stuck to roles and it can be quite harmful along the way because you don't see each other as you are right now but you kind of like always come back fall back into the role where you first met and this can happen if both or any anyone involved is not aware that we actually we change and we need to work on this and like actually that a relationship is just a moving average of the last let's say 50 days or 60 days nothing else and but maybe let's let's define also what culture is and isn't in my opinion so because like for many like the notion of culture is so yeah intangible it's like this fluffy topic it's like it's something like it's almost impossible to define or work on but actually it's not Let's maybe start with what a culture between people is not. It is not a PowerPoint slide that kind of lays out wishful values, how you would like to be perceived as a group, as a couple, as a, French, a friendship. It is not preaching values, it's actually doing values. It's not what you say, what you are, who you are, it's actually what you do on an everyday basis. A culture is not a big event or a retreat or a workshop or a holiday where you can like see this, this is our culture and we have like now we, now I'm talking about a perspective for company culture. Hey, now we did this one week company culture retreat and we all had fun and now we can just go back to work with a great culture. That's not culture. It's not a one-off cultural event where people have fun. It's actually, <laughs> that's, yeah, I think this happens way too often. Culture is actually very simple. And simple doesn't mean easy, by the way. It is emergent behavior. Culture is nothing else what you have been collectively doing every day. And if you boil it down to the smallest unit, it's about what you have been doing every day between two people. And it starts with two people, then three or four people, friendship, part like between two partners in a family in a company where you have a bigger group of people but still it's how you do things in between these people you, you scale it up to a nation community and you scale it up to the world and referring to the first video it's about dreams as well you know culture is nothing else about how you define how you do things how people say and do things what you do in certain situations, how aware you are of these actions, effects, how you deal with tough situations, 
how you celebrate, how you grow, how to learn, how to listen, how to see each other. That is culture. What you have been collectively doing every day. What you do, what you say, how you say it, how you do it. It is as simple as that. I've been thinking about this the week just like, now that I stayed at my dad's place for three weeks, it's like, how do I greet him in the morning? With a smile and a hug? Or with a grumpy state of mind? It's very simple. I choose to greet him with a smile on my face and give him a hug and a kiss. Very simple things. It's a moving average. And this hasn't been always the way it has. It's just, it, it, it changed, of course. And in any relationship, you always have to be aware it's a moving average. And why I'm so grateful, especially with, for my dear friend Pete, because he reached out to me last week and he sent me a beautiful voice message and he's like, hey man, you know what happened this February? I think we both felt that something was broken and he had the courage to reach out, which I didn't. And then we had a beautiful, very healing conversation and I think that's why I'm so grateful for this friendship because we always have been very good at sharing and be vulnerable. And we had a beautiful conversation and we were able to give this little hiccup this February a new meaning. We, we understood that this thing had to happen so we can actually see each other of how we are now. We kind of had to leave and bury these old versions of ourselves behind. And now we have to we can able to we are able to give new meaning and reshape our friendship and see each other and learn about who we are right now. And this inspired me for this topic. Like once we understand actually that any relationship, any relationship culture is a moving average. We can say it's the last 50 days, we can say it's the last six months, it doesn't matter, but it's a moving average. It's quite dangerous to under, to kind of like fall into the trap that just because we met someone a few, a few years ago or a month ago, that this is how it is. Now it's a very conscious process of being always aware of how do we do things. Who, do, who are we right now? Do we see still see each other? This can be applied to any form of culture, any company culture as well. How do we start meetings? How do we communicate? How transparent are we are? How do we give feedback? How do we celebrate? How do we learn? It's so simple. It's just actions every day. And you don't have to breach them. You don't have to create a PowerPoint slide. You don't have to create a workshop. You don't have to create a retreat. You can start change any moment. It starts with you, how you do little things. It all starts with the little things. And yeah, I'm so we had a beautiful preparing talk, me and Pete, and we're very excited about where our friendship will, what will come out of this now. And yeah, I mean, how are we? <laughs> just like, you know, like, to just keep an idea of how we met. I mean, like, there was this always this notion, and it's very funny, like, a it makes sense because we were in a long distance relationship in a sense and we every time we met and traveled we were kind of like the process or progress we made independently when we we're not together didn't really match but also like it's a sense of feeling making the other feel comfortable you kind of like try to fall back into the role the other person is used to but you forget that the other person does the same thing and we both are not comfortable in these roles because like you know 12 years ago 11 10 years ago we there are people who, you know, we partied, we drank, we smoked weed, we roasted each other like this. What you might might think is like kind of like, yeah, it's normal in friendships. You roast each other, but actually it's quite toxic. And we both acknowledge it. And we both laughed about it. It's like, yeah, th we both don't want it. And we just did it because we did it 10 years ago. And yeah, it kind of like time and progress stopped every time we met. And this just makes sense because it's different when you actually... Yeah, it's just, it makes sense. If you're in long distance, 
friendship, doesn't matter. You meet, you got, meet each other. And if you're not aware and consciously work on your friendship and aware of like, hey man, where are we now? How do we check that we don't live or take on, take with us traits and behaviors that are not really who we are right now? How do we make sure, how do we work on that? And yeah, this conversation was beautiful. We acknowledged things, how we hurt each other, how we how we failed to see each other who we are right now. But that's why I'm so grateful for this friendship. And I think I'm dedicating this episode to my friend Pete. So if you're listening to this, this is for you, buddy. That uh, we are able to give meaning to it and Yeah, aware of like who we are right now and like are also ready to explore who we are right now and really learn from each other. And that's wow, I'm I'm getting goosebumps right now, just having having a friend like this. That's the beauty of life. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we're coming to an end now, slowly, but I think that I have why so this is what I wrote the day after, I think the two days after. I had this conversation with Pete. I'm going to read it to you now. Um, yeah. Let's play this one. Should we put it with music? At these moments, I would love to have like live audiences. Like, hey guys, do you want music on this or not? Um... Yeah, I actually should not use it. Uh, the other day it was funny. We did a short real video. And even though I have the license for the background music, um, TikTok blocked me. <laughs> 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 but I have the license for the music, but there's a like it's while it's copyrights issues, and of course it's a pain in the ass to contact them. So let's do it without music. I hope you you don't mind because I don't wanna risk getting blocked again. <laughs> Like a company culture, any relationship culture is an active process that requires to not take anything for granted and to actively work on a relationship, to be proactive, to see each other where we are now and not where we were when we met so we can su support each other's growth in life. Too often, we can get too comfortable with the version of a person we got to know initially, potentially hindering the growth of another, but also as a unit. Any relationship is work, but if you love this work, it never feels like work, but like a wonderful ride of exploration, curiosity, learning, laughing and love, laughing and loving. It means tough conversations, it means beautiful conversations, it means silly conversations, it means all kinds of conversations. The idea of a relationship is fictional. What it is, is actually just two lights dancing together. The concept of a relationship is to give this dance a meaning, a dance floor. Yet we should never limit this dance floor. This leads to ignorance. It needs to be flexible enough to allow growth and occasional hiccup and slip. Yet it is a moving average that constantly needs to be worked on with full awareness, mindfulness and ultimately understanding. Forming a culture and relationship together means to dance together on this beautiful dance floor called life. So, uh, my dear listeners, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope I would love to hear your take on this is a relationship a culture moving average and how if so if you agree like how do you make sure in your relationships with your family if your partner with your friends or in a company that you don't miss on that you're aware of the change that you're aware of how you do things that you don't slip and are not talked about because this can lead to toxic peace would love to hear your feedback and for me, I've learned a lot this week. To be even more aware, to be even more conscious, to drive things forward, not just, especially in relationships. You know, like you can be very aware about yourself, but for me, it has shown 
to even put more effort in being aware of how I do things with the people I work with, I live with, I engage with, I dance with. And to really have tough conversations and be honest and vulnerable. Because it really can hurt both parties if we don't acknowledge things. It can lead to toxic peace. And actually, at the end of the day, none of the parties involved, people involved, want to hurt each other. Just want to be understood. With that said, I thank you very much for this episode. Thank you for listening. Thank you, PD, for this beautiful talk we had this week. I'm looking forward to what this friendship will become. So up until ah, up, until next week, have a wonderful, wonderful day.